And now I'd like to welcome to the podium somebody that I was in Washington, D.C. with in March of 2012. 20,000 atheists gathered there for the Reason Rally. And we all stood in the rain <laughs> and suffered and made it through. Uh, Jeff Schroeder is a Army veteran, uh, retired from the U.S. Army. He lives in Mountain Home and serves on the Mountain Home City Council. And yes, he is an atheist. Jeff? Thank you. Thank you very much. This is very impressive to see this many people here for this event. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to come here to engage and to show how important how important reason is as a basis for policy and, and the importance of keeping religion and government separate. How many people here, let's, let me ask a different question than on my script. How many people here are Republicans? Whoa. Okay. More on that in a minute. How many here vote? Yeah! Great. That's great. I vote too. In fact, I tried to vote today for school board. Turns out I'm in the, uh, not in the right zone, so I couldn't vote. Voting's an important right, and more importantly, it's a duty for all of us. We are our government. But what has voting gotten us? Just more of what goes on in this building behind me every year. Voting can't be the solution for the problems that Susan outlined, because the results of mere voting are crystal clear. More government entanglement with religion, and more religious intrusion in our lives with the laws that they pass. Mere voting doesn't do much good when the choices on the ballot are bad, worse, or none. No, voting's a necessary, but it's a far from sufficient task to keep the theocrats at bay. Voting doesn't do much good when we don't follow up that vote with regular face-to-face -face or phone contact with those we elected. Voting by itself does no good when those we elect never see us at council meetings, committee hearings, or in the hallways of the building behind me. Voting does no good when those we elect hear only from people paid to sway their opinions and thereby get a distorted sense of what you think. We have the government we elected by voting. We have the government we earned by our actions. Clearly, those actions aren't enough. Involvement, engagement, and activism are what's needed to keep the wall intact and reverse the dangerous trend that we see here. There's also some bravery necessary. By coming here today, you're showing a willingness to engage and to be involved, and to be brave. Showing our numbers here sends a message, not as much to the occupants of this building, but importantly with others whose voices are unheard or who are afraid or feel that no one is looking out for them in keeping church and state separate. Much more than voting and showing up at a rally, however, is needed. Whose fault is this current state of affairs? These ever-larger steps toward theocracy, these ridiculous pieces of le legislation passed in this building. Whose fault is it? Look no further than your closest mirror. It's our fault. It's our apathy, our non-engagement, and our disengagement that lets this stuff run rampant. And by our, I mean some, maybe not any of you, but more so the collective rest of us who firmly believe in the separation of church and state but who think the cause is lost or that working toward it is futile in such a conservative state. To that I say false. The results of our apathy, non-engagement, or disengagement is visible right behind me in this building for three months beginning each January. As unimaginable as it may seem, as bad as each session looks at its close, the following sessions continue to be worse than the ones before. So what do we do to reverse the trend? What's to be done when we have no choice or only bad choices at election time? That's a great question. Here's a ballot. We all know how to run one of these. You fill in the little circles. Your name goes here. The first, easiest, and simplest step you can take to make a difference. Get your name on a ballot. Precinct committeeman, councilman, commissioner, senator, representative. Worried about what party to join? Back to my first question. Here's a news flash. If you live in a district with all Republican res representation, you're a Republican by default. Challenge Republican thinking and challenge a Republican in the primary. It can be done. 
Oh, but I don't know the right people. I don't have enough money. I don't have permission from the party. Not valid excuses. In 2014, a non-political, completely unknown educator from Mountain Home with no money, no connections, no name recognition, and no voting record, coupled with active opposition from parts of the Republican Party, ran as a Republican for state superintendent of public instruction and won. Have you ever heard the phrase, there are no atheists in foxholes? I was one of the many people who busted that myth in 2004 by driving 600 miles across Iraq without emitting a single prayer. Have you ever heard the phrase, atheists can't get elected? I busted that myth in 2007 when I ran for city council. I busted it in 2010 when I ran as Republican precinct committeeman. I busted it in 2012. I busted it in 2013 and a fifth time in 2014. And this is my license plate. It is absolutely not true that atheists cannot get elected. Simply having an opposition name on a ballot in a primary sends a message to both the incumbent and to the electorate at large. Someone is dissatisfied and somebody wants to do something about it. And yes, it's true that you, you, little old you, can run for and get elected to public office. Yes, you can. Even if you don't win, the election numbers can send a powerful message to the incumbent. Get back to work for us and listen next time I talk to you. And even if you do have a legitimate excuse not to run for office, which I highly doubt that any of you do, you still know someone who could. And if you aren't repeating this lecture to them every time you see them, you'll continue to remain part of the problem and we'll just get more of the same that happens in this building. The next step of how you can make a difference. Engagement. Meaningful, respectful, eye-to-eye -eye engagement and conversation and dialogue with your elected officials in the building behind me. What about those lobbyists lurking in the hallways, schmoozing the legislators? Well, how about the fact that legislators have open spots in their lunch calendars because their calendars aren't filled up with visits from us? Lobbyists and other advocates step into a communication vacuum we create by our silence. Guess what? In the hierarchy of who gets the senator's ear, you ought to come first if you're from their district. Become your own lobbyist. You don't even have to file a report. But when you do engage these guys, and it's easier than you think, Speak positively sometimes. Take time to thank them for the things they do right, even the ones that I disagree with the most. Even a bloke broken clock is right twice a day. They'll be more receptive to your honest criticism if criticism isn't the only thing they ever hear from you. Be sincere and authentic. Be original. Stand in that hallway. Grab your legislator after a committee hearing. They remember meaningful, positive engagements. So engage. Step right up when they're talking to a lobbyist. Say it directly. I'm here to see whose interests you represent. Me, the person who put you here, or that lobbyist and contributor who is apparently buying you lunch right now. The more they know that you are informed, engaged, and active, the more they will have to balance what they hear from you against the lobbyists and advocacy groups. Even more important, changing the perception of the lobbyist role of gatekeeper to occupying public office. Since elections can be won without their support, Sitting legislators should have less incentive to give lobbyist concerns more weight than yours, and the lobbyists one day might start chasing you down for lunch to show that you are a serious challenge to an incumbent. So remember this. Voting is just the minimum. It's not working. It's not enough. You need to run for office. You need to get someone to run for office, and you need to actively engage the process constantly and positively. It will make a difference. It already has, and I do it all the time. The price of our apathy and disengagement will be particularly visible here in 11 days when the legislature reconvenes to right a wrong done out of ignorance. And it actually has a dollar cost, roughly 30000 So make sure no one runs unopposed in the primary, and make sure that when a lobbyist is whispering in your legislator's ear, you're shouting into the other one, I'm watching, and I might be coming for you at the next election. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff.